lecture 14, a theology of false theology. In this class to this point, we've talked about some of the core doctrines for understanding our salvation. We talked about the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. And we recognized within those discussions, particularly Christology or the doctrine of Christ, we recognize that these are the areas where we find some of the greatest distortions of Christianity. People are going to attack the doctrine of the Trinity. Certainly, they're going to attack the deity of Christ. And that's going to lead in directions that would be ultimately damning. Differences of theological viewpoint that make all the difference in a person's salvation and their eternal state. So how do we think about this? Or how do we process alternative views about theology, other frameworks. And to do that, I would like us to take the time here at the end of our discussion in this semester to talk about a, fault, a theology of false theology. Meaning, I, I could tell you what's wrong with some of these ideas. I, I could tell you that certain ideas are unbiblical or they don't fit the statements of scripture. But just for us to get a grid or a framework an entire lens for understanding what false theology even is and how biblically should I view false theology? Can, can I get a, an interpretation, a lens from scripture for how to interpret even the existence of false theology? Does scripture have anything to say to us about the existence of false theology and how we as believers ought to respond? Well, I would certainly say it does and quite a bit actually. I'll start with this. Uh, false theology or erroneous theology is something that should not at all surprise us. In fact, we should expect to encounter it. And I can demonstrate that from both testaments. I'm being extremely selective here. But if we just look, for instance, as we think through the Old Testament, the pattern I've chosen to show you here is taken from Ezekiel 34. And he's talking about the quote unquote shepherds of Israel. And God's saying to them, tell these shepherds, whoa, because they don't feed themselves. They feed on the flocks. They're actually eating the sheep instead of taking care of the flocks. These false shepherds are lying. And God says to them, I will deal with them. I will judge them because they are lying servants. They are shepherds that don't take care of the sheep at all. If I extend that metaphor and I move now to the New Testament, there's an interesting pattern that I think parallels that. Jesus warns his disciples, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. I mean, in a way, they're offering themselves as people who will teach and help you, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. They are, uh, they're going to devour you. Later in John 10, Jesus will talk about the shepherds that are just hirelings. They're in it for the money. They're not actually there out of concern for the sheep at all. Matthew 10, 16, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And the reason this thread is so helpful is if I continue on now, Jesus has returned to heaven. And now Paul is speaking at the end of his life. And so in Paul words, Paul's words, I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Do you see the pattern that has stretched? And I, I've chosen to do this only just with this metaphor of shepherds, sheep, wolves. And we can demonstrate from both Testaments that there are those who would devour the flock instead of care for the flock. The discovery then that we're recognizing is that failed theology, erroneous theology, false theology is not the surprise. On the contrary, I would like to argue here that this is the norm. You should not at all or in the least be surprised to discover this happening because the entire history of God's people, yes, even the entire history of the ministry is full of this sort of thing. False shepherds who deceive the sheep and twist theology towards their own ends. Why does this happen? I mean, questions I could ask here. If scripture is clear, if Christianity is demonstrably the best way to understand truth and reality, and if the gospel truly transforms hearts, why would I end up with twisted, perverted, 
distorted ideas about God. And I'd like to take the time here setting up an introduction for our discussion to discuss each one of the divisions of theology. At this point, I'm backing away. I'm not talking about this semester, but I'm talking about all of Bible doctrines, all of systematic theology. I'm going to go through the major divisions of systematic theology from bibliology, theology proper, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of man, angelology, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of salvation, and the doctrine of last things. In each one of these respects, I would like to demonstrate that there is a strong biblical framework that supports or explains what's going on here. None of this is a surprise, given the framework for how we even understand and recognize the truth about theology, then we can see exactly how or why these things happen. I'm going to start with theology proper and the doctrine of the Trinity. And I'd like to demonstrate here that the words of God are always true. The problem is not at all that God has not communicated himself well, or that God has not made his truth evident. On the contrary, God defines truth. God is truth. And a couple of passages that do this. Here, Isaiah 45, verse 19, I have not spoken in secret. I've not spoken in some dark place of the earth. I, I declare things that are right, he says. Isaiah 65, 16, this is the God of truth. He is the God of truth. And what he says stands as true. John 4, 24, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Romans 3, 4, let God be true that every man found a liar. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the ages began. I mean, is this a, an evident foundation for thinking about initially this doctrine and what we're understanding? That the problem is not with God. God is the source of truth, and he speaks only truth. In fact, in this particular semester, we talked not only about the doctrine of God, but we talked about the doctrine of the Trinity. And in that respect, we, understanding each one of the persons, talked about their, their, their functional role, how they in, are revealed across scripture in terms of their ministry and their work. Well, we can do the same here in respect to truth. And a couple of passages that do that, demonstrating not only that God is a God of truth, but that each one of the persons of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are spoken of in these same ways. Here's Jesus Christ, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here's the Holy Spirit. He, when the he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. He speaks whatsoever he hears that will he speak. He will show you things to come. Here's the father, John 17, Jesus speaking, praying to the father. And he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Uh, again, so son, Holy Spirit, father, we see this concept of God as a God of truth. And if I continue on here, this is he that came by water and the blood, Jesus Christ. It is the spirit that bears witness because the spirit is truth. Or 1 John 5, 20, we know that the Son of God has come, he has given us understanding, that we may know him that is true. We are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. In this case, I'm seeing both the doctrine of the Father and the doctrine of the Son. And it's there to demonstrate for us that, yes, God is a God of truth. In fact, to go beyond, we can talk about each one of the persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the demonstration that they speak truth that they are truth. I want to move then from thinking about this foundation, God as the ground of truth, God is the one who defines truth, to the reality also that God has revealed himself. And here what I would add is God offers only truth, the error has not come from him, nor is his revelation the problem. God is not a God that speaks in confusing ways. The problem is not that his word is so difficult to understand. God is a good communicator. He has communicated well. And here's a foundation for thinking about the doctrine of revelation and relating it here to our discussion about theological error. It's the recognition that we must have solid, rock, bedrock, solid faith that God has told us exactly what we need to know in order to live faithfully, righteously, and godly in this present world. And, and that goes further. If God hasn't addressed a question or an issue or a topic, 
this kind of faith would say, if he hasn't addressed it, or if the information is not there in scripture, then it apparently falls into a category of things I, I don't necessarily need to know. And there's a lot more I could say about this. And there's the recognition within systematic theology. We are sometimes looking at two doctrines and working to understand how they fit together. Okay, there's a, a concept of good and necessary consequence that certain concepts would lead to other concepts. Okay, granted that. But if scripture never gives us any information or addresses something at all, then our faith is to say, I don't need to know it. Let's go further. I don't even want to know it. God has told me all that I ought to know. What then is defining the truth or the theological realities that we have to know and obey? Well, let's just extend this thought and continue on with it. So we can recognize that scripture is the standard we use to do theology. Passages that argue this way or help us see this, 2 Corinthians 4, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We handle the word of God not deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 is continuing this. This is a passage to which we'll return later. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed, you were sealed. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And finally, James 1.18, of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth. Now, can you see the pattern here? What is scripture? Scripture is the word of truth. Scripture is here, the word of truth. Or if I move upward in the passages, this is the light that shines in our hearts, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that brings us to the word of truth, the gospel. And in all of these, what I'm arguing then is that I'm finding across scripture the confidence that God has spoken. He has spoken in a sufficient way for us to know all that we ought to know. And even, yes, to be able to contradict, refute, or reject error. In fact, if you remember back to the definition that we have used as our operative definition for theology, theology is carefully answering questions about God and the world using scripture. Okay, so how then am I going to be able to identify error? How will I be able to look at something and know this idea is wrong? And the answer is, well, the test is always scripture. Scripture defines truth and error. Now, as we continue to build out our theology of error, then what we've gotten so far is that God is the source of truth. God has spoken truth in his word. And so the doctrines of God or the Trinity, and second, the doctrine of revelation, have led us to the point that if we're going to find truth, God alone offers it to us. But on the way, a question I'd like, I would like to ask, is it really that simple after all? I mean, you say scripture is the standard for identifying error and rejecting it and then acknowledging truth and following it. But isn't it true, for instance, that the Pharisees were scholars of scripture? They studied these things, and in spite of all their study, they came away rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. So it's not so simple, you might want to, to, to suggest. It's just saying, follow scripture, obey it, and you always come out in the right place. Well, I mean, apparently these guys were students of the law and they never understood it. The argument being that, yes, God has spoken, but it's not always so easy. It's not always so clear. And I'd like to push back on that idea a little bit. Let me just show you the way Jesus interacts with the Pharisees around this question. When they're raising different criticisms of him, well, how would we really know what is truth and what is wrong? Jesus' answer to them is pretty simple. The pattern here in Jesus' interaction goes, have you never read? Or have you read in the law? Or have you never read? Have you never read in the scriptures? Did you not read? Do you not therefore err? You, you, you don't know the scriptures. The pattern of these passages is to say, scripture is not some kind of complex, arcane, mysterious book. And only if you're a scholar, are you going to be able to figure out what is true. On the contrary, Jesus' assumption about this, just read it. Just read the book. It, it's right there. These books, or the, this, this book, the Old Testament, testifies of me. 
you just need to read it and then you'll see it's it's apparent just read it and i'd like to qualify or continue to build our understanding of scripture this isn't to say that there aren't challenging passages even some really difficult passages to work through okay granted but the assumption of it goes when it comes right down to acknowledging error when it comes down to figuring out what is true and what I should believe and what is false and I should reject, uh, the assumption of scripture goes, oh, you can do this. You need to read. Um, my argument then would be in developing a theology of false theology, or let's say it in these terms, you as a believer trying to sort out what is true and false and how to understand and don't think to yourself that working out what is heretical or what is false doctrine and how to reject it, that only belongs to the scholar types. On the contrary, I would encourage you, read your Bible. Read your Bible with the confidence that God's word is clear and will guide you to the truth. And no, it's not so complicated that only the real nerdy types are going to be able to figure out truth from error. Wait a minute, you say. What about this passage? Peter's writing, and of course, Peter is an apostle. He has a good, solid understanding of the gospel. And he comments here that the apostle Paul, the beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom that is given, has written. And he speaks as also in all his epistles of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. So you might observe that actually there are passages that are really difficult to understand. And so maybe it, it does just belong to the scholar types. I mean, how am I going to be able to acknowledge error when it's difficult? Even Peter admits that some of these passages are difficult. And I include this passage in our discussion just to recognize here that the doctrine of clarity in Scripture is never there to say that there are no challenging passages. There are. It's not there to say that you'll be able to simply and clearly understand every passage. If you have struggled to understand certain passages, welcome to the club. I struggled too. The argument, on the other hand, goes, for understanding these core doctrines, truth from error, false theology from true theology, every believer can do that. Are there some difficult passages? Yes. Can you yourself read scripture and understand what is true and what is false? Yes. And part of my argument for that would be that let's take a closer look at the passage now. Continue on. Yes, Paul has written some things that are hard to be understood. But the ones who struggle with those passages, in fact, are they that are unlearned and unstable, they're wrestling with these passages as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. The situation you've got here is actually people who are unstable of heart, people who are unbelieving in heart, and they're not willing to come to scripture obediently and faithfully. Oh yes, those people will struggle. They'll struggle with the hard passages and they'll walk right past the clear passages. So are you as a believer going to sometimes encounter really difficult passages? Yes. What should you do? Continue reading your Bible. Understand all that you can understand, grow, and remain faithful and believing. God's words are clear, not confusing. He has spoken with clarity so that you and I and every believer can remain faithful in our understanding of the truth. Well, that still raises a question, because if I'm talking about God's word as clear, his revelation as evident to all who will come to faith in him, the truth is error still exists. So uh, one of the questions I'd like to understand and like to discuss here is, well, if so, then why does error happen? It would seem to me that error should not even be a thing if scripture speaks so clearly. And for that, I'd like to move to the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of humanity. My fundamental commitment or my fundamental idea here would be that the problem in our understanding or the thing that gets messed up as we start working with scripture, it's not a problem in scripture. It's not a problem with God revealing himself. And these are the concepts that we've already talked about thus far in our discussion. The recognition here that God, theology proper, the doctrine of the Trinity, God is truth. 
His words are always true. And secondly, the recognition, the doctrine of revelation, the problem is not God's truth being confusing. He has communicated well. Add one more to it, though. And the third doctrine to discuss here is the doctrine of sin and humanity. Now, the idea here is that the problem is not with Scripture, and it's not with God's communicating. The problem is sin. Sin corrupts our thinking, and we are not good judges of truth, because our own hearts would actually prefer to take a different way, rejecting God's truth, finding our own way in its place. Let me explain what I mean by that, and let's look at some passages that move along these lines. So the first set of ideas, or the first set of passages, is just to recognize that this is, this is a multi-layered problem. It's not just that our minds are not understanding, it's not just an intellectual problem. But what we're talking about with error is multiple problems, multiple layers. It goes down to everything about us. Error happens in our hearts because of what we choose, our wills. Errors happens in our hearts because of our emotions, what we love or how we feel about God's truth. It happens in us because of our desires. We sometimes choose certain ideas or certain theological commitments because we want them to be true. And in fact, then, error is a corruption of the entire person. The problem in error is not that just my mind got a little mixed up or I had a little bit of an intellectual problem understanding this or that idea. The problem in the case of error is that my heart wants certain things to be true. My emotions respond to it. My will chooses it. And then my mind accepts it. Passages that would argue this way or that would support this kind of idea. Jesus speaking during his own ministry. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, watch the reasoning. Everyone that does evil hates the light. So if I'm looking at the phrase, does evil, fair enough to say, I think, that doing evil is focused on the will, the choice, what you want to do. And yet what you discover is that the person who does evil, an action type, turns away from light, intellectual, Neither will they come to the light, lest their deeds would be reproved. Our problem is not just an intellectual one, but our problem is a choice of the will and of desire. Similarly, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 12 argues that they might all be damned who believed not the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. A pleasure in unrighteousness sounds more, it's not an intellectual category, it's a, a category of desire. It's a category of preference. It's what somebody wants and what they love. And what we're recognizing in that is to say, the problem with error is not just that someone didn't study hard enough in doctrines class. That could be part of it. But it's even that they want certain things to be true. I can demonstrate this as well from a concept that's strong across, particularly the pastoral epistles. But it's strong across the entire New Testament. And it's the pattern of a, a kind of a, a reciprocal relationship, a back and forth relationship between truth and our, our actions, truth and the will. So let me show you what that looks like in terms of a diagram. Here's the concept that I recognize there is unhealthy doctrine. So the error that we've been talking about. There's also sinful living. And when I put the category of sinful living here, I'm recognizing that this is a, an ethical kind of category. This is the choice of what you want to do and the lifestyle that you choose, your desires, what you believe is right and wrong. So let's put in here as an example, a person who is covetous. They think a lot about money. They crave and hoard money. Well, that's a sinful lifestyle. That is going to be matched by an unhealthy doctrine. And so I can talk about certain theological errors, prosperity theology, the kind of assumption or teaching that if you just do all the right things, God will make sure that you become rich. Well, that's a false theology. See, but you discover the false theology is nicely paired with the things that people want to do. 
you can find all kinds of other examples like this. Let's give another example of someone who wants a sensual lifestyle. Maybe they've been ensnared in pornography, or maybe they are involved in an illicit relationship. Well, a person like that can find a theology to support that. And you might discover that there was a theology there emphasizing a lot about grace in the sense of, well, God forgives, or we live in a time of grace where not God's not going to condemn certain things. It even could come down to recent contemporary discussions about what is morally, ethically correct and right, whether two people uh, in a certain uh, same gender or a person who's married to someone else, whether it's possible for them to divorce and go to someone else just because they want it. I mean, you can get into all of these kinds of questions that are technically in some ways theological questions, and yet, in fact, you discover they're going to lead to a sinful lifestyle or a different way of conducting oneself. Why? Because you actually want that thing to be true, and you want it to be true bad enough that you'll find a way for it to be true, at least in your mind. Biblical support for these kinds of ideas. The pastorals talk about this constantly, the confluence or the overlap between healthy doctrine and righteous living. So here are the passages that would do this and many others. People that profess they know God, but they deny him by their works. Did you know that it's possible to live out false theology? Not just that false theology is a thing someone says, but that false theology can be a thing someone does. In their actions, they do false theology. They're abominable, disobedient unto every good work. They are reprobate. 1 John 2, verse 4, the person who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, that person is a liar. The truth is not in him. Now, the truth is not, not in him sounds like a, an intellectual or conceptual problem, right? Truth. Okay, it's about what is true, what is false. Correct. That's true, yes. At the same time, the actions failing to keep God's commandments is what proves that someone is not in the truth. Jude 16, people like this are murmurers, complainers. They walk after their own lust. lusts. Okay, here we're in the category of desire. Their mouth speaks great swelling words. And because of advantage, meaning because of what they want, then they go out and they collect other people's admiration. Well, it's from their desires, their lusts that lead to their words. Jude 18, I've told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own godly lusts. Do you see the connection here? These people are false teachers. But the proof of their being false teachers or living out an erroneous theology is their lusts, their actions, their desires. Revelation 2, here, people that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And part of the proof that this is a false doctrine, the doctrine of Balaam, an erroneous theology, is that they teach people to sacrifice unto idols and commit fornication. Revelation 2.20, here's the teaching of Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. So again, we're in the category of false teaching or a false teacher. What shows that she's a false teacher? She teaches, that sounds intellectual, and she just seduces my servants to commit fornication. You discover, in fact, then, that her false teaching or her false doctrine is not just a set of ideas, but her false teaching and her false doctrine leads then to, connects then with false living. False doctrine and false living stand together, run together, and lead into the same realities. So we've progressed further now in our understanding of this theology of false theology to say not only the theology doctrine or theology proper, the doctrine of God, that God is the source of truth, the doctrine of revelation, that God's truth is clear. But now thirdly, that our sin corrupts our thinking. We are not good judges of truth. It corrupts our thinking. It corrupts our desires. It corrupts every part of us until we don't see straight because we would actually prefer our ideas over God's truth. That leads me then to continue on, because do you realize the story is actually even darker still? It's not even just that we, the humans, have a problem, but there's a, a, a nasty kind of connection between our own desires and the satanic realm. What I'm doing now is I've moved from the doctrine of revelation and the doctrine of anthropology or humanity into the doctrine of angelology. 
And pause here for a second. You might be tempted if I said to you, well, there's a connection between false theology and angels or demons. You might be tempted to think there's nothing here. I mean, how would these be connected? What I'm going to argue, though, and demonstrate from Scripture is that the false theology is not just a thing people do. It's not just that humans are the only false theologians, but there was a false theologian before any of this. Satan himself is the father of lies, the paradigmatic or the champion of them all. He is the false theologian that stands behind all of the false theology. He's the ultimate liar and the ultimate deceiver. He's the chief false theologian. And we can see this also from scripture from the earliest times. So Genesis 3, you know this story, but as Satan comes to tempt Eve, he is more subtle, it says. He is more clever than any beast of the field. And his cleverness, he comes to her and he asks, has God really said that you cannot eat of every tree of the garden? In fact, he starts to challenge her about it. God said that if you ate of it, you would surely die. Satan's answer, you will not surely die. In fact, he's going to impugn God's motives. God knows in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened. You will be as gods knowing good and evil. Satan can find a way to call God a liar and make that appealing to your heart. You can hear a lie like that. And it can sound like, that's pretty good. I like those ideas. Yeah, that's a whole lot better than what I grew up thinking. Don't be surprised or shocked when false theology is very appealing. Of course it's appealing. Expect that it's appealing. It probably will sound much better than anything else you've ever heard because Satan knows how to communicate well and in a way that appeals to your heart. John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, Jesus says. The lusts of your father ye will do. Note here on the way, this fits with my idea earlier, that our desires match up with the, the ideas. So it's not just ideas intellectual over here and desires and, and preferences and wills over here, but it all matches up. You want these things to be true. The lust of your father he will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own or it comes right out of himself because he is a liar and he's the father of it. I mean, it's fair enough in building up a theology of false religion or theological error. It's fair enough to say Satan is the original father of theological error. He's really good at it. This is his specialty. In fact, 2 Corinthians goes on to build that idea. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. It's not just that they went and they studied a very difficult, complicated book, the Bible. They got done and it was all confusing to them. That's not it. That's not it at all. There's something darker going on. In them, verse 4, the God of this world, that's Satan, has blind the minds of those who do not believe. Okay, now I'd like to highlight here for a second. That, that before then we put everything on Satan, let's recognize there's kind of a partnership between this, between these individuals. And I'll come back to that idea later. But Satan blinds their minds and they refuse to believe anyway. It's their unbelief combined with Satan's deception and everybody likes it. Both Satan and those who want to reject God's truth are thinking the same way about the conclusions they reach. And so the result of this, the blinding of their minds of unbelieving people is so that the light of the glories of gospel of Christ who is the image of God so that it will not shine on them. Think about a dark room. Think about a bright light. And now would anybody in a room pitch dark and suddenly there's a shaft of light coming through? Will anybody have trouble figuring out what is true and how to believe it? Look at it. I mean, it's the only bright thing in the room. The only way you could possibly miss it would be if you were blind. And that's exactly what Satan does. Make it impossible for them to see what is glaringly, blazingly, beautifully true. 1 John 4, 6, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. But notice that it's not just a question of the information. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 
and you can read through the rest of first John to see this pattern, the concept of spirits of error or false spirits, demons that are confusing the minds of those who are blind to the truth. Second John verse seven, many deceivers are entered into the world who do confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist, a false Christ. Why? Deceivers, false teachers. And you can see in this language that is ambiguous enough that it could refer either to human false teachers or demonic false teachers. There's not really that much difference when it comes down to the reality of their false teaching and their deception. Re Revelation 12, verse 9, we're talking about Satan, and the description goes, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, the dragon, and one more, the deceiver, the deceiver of the whole world. Revelation 28, at the end of the story, he will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And that, all the way to the end, is Satan's deception to mislead and to distort the truth to keep people from coming to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Realize then that biblically speaking, the fact of theological error is nothing new. This is not like a, a problem within our lifetimes because I don't know, we have the internet now or something. But that this is as old as the existence of sin from the very beginning Satan himself misled, distorted, deceived the hearts of people. And it is then a deeply demonic thing. False teaching connects back to the father of lies, Satan himself. And yet before then we say, aha, then all theological error goes back to Satan. Let's recognize that there's a little bit more to the story too, because the people also love it. And, and it's not just then that the people as honest searchers are going out trying to find out what the truth is, but Satan's tricky and he's misled them. On the contrary, people would prefer the truth, the er error over truth. People would prefer that God and his word not be the thing that controls their thinking and their lives. It's our hearts that respond to the error and love it. Satan, in partnership with the brokenness of our own hearts leading towards destruction, chaos, and death. Thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Because there's also the pattern that through faith and through the truth, God restores us to wholeness. What I've done now is I've moved from the doctrine of angels or demons, and I've moved to the doctrine of salvation. And I'm recognizing here then that there's a transformation that starts from the very beginning, God's work in our hearts to make us different, to make us, as one passage talks about it, wise unto salvation. Passages that lead us in this direction. I'm going to show you in Ephesians 4, an extended passage. I want you to recognize the intellectual words. What I mean by that are the words for truth. And let's see if we can identify how many words for truth appear in this passage or how often the passage speaks in those kinds of terms. Starting here, Ephesians 4, 17, walk no longer as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Arguably, you could even talk about hardness and heart as the same kind of category. They've become callous. They've given themselves over to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, in this language or in this phrase, I'm really talking, right, about things that are quite practical and ethical, righteous living. But you discover that that wicked living, unrighteous living, that kind of wicked living is attached back to the way people think what I've already said, the notion that wrong thinking or false doctrine leads to wicked living. Now, continue with the pattern, talking about these words for intellectual knowledge, faith, understanding, starting in verse 20. This is not the way you learned Christ. You have heard him. You were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. It's corrupt through deceitful desires. Isn't that beautiful? Or just, isn't that a, a clear expression of this idea that it's, it's desires, it's ethical, ethical categories. What is right? What is wrong? What do you do? 
sin, but it's not just the concept of what you do. It's actually deceitful. It's wrapped up as well. Intellectual and, and, and ethical go together. That you would be renewed in the spirit of your minds. That you would put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. My point being that the passage is absolutely full of this kind of intellectual language. You learned Christ, you understood him, and yet it's truth that leads to actions. And if I'm arguing then from the background of false doctrine or theological error, what is Jesus Christ doing in our salvation? What is happening in the doctrine of salvation? Well, our brokenness all within, heart, mind, will, desires, everything, all of that preferred error, we would rather turn away from God's truth and seek our own way. Salvation is the process of God transforming us from within and changing back, making right and good our desires, our wills, our hearts, our minds, every part of us now made correct and whole. John 3, 19, we talked about this passage earlier, and we talked about it in negative terms. So here's the judgment. The light has come. People love the darkness rather than the light. Human beings, fallen human beings, would rather turn away. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light. They don't come to it lest their works would be exposed. But I didn't read the rest of the passage. The next verse extends it. Whoever does what is true that's an intellectual category, a question of what is true doctrine, what is false doctrine. If you have the true doctrine, no, go further. If you do the true doctrine, you come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that your works have been carried out in God, that God has transformed you. Have you ever wondered why the, the condition for salvation is faith? So, you know, God could have given all kinds of different bases. How do you, we might say, get saved? How do you come to faith, or excuse me, how do you come to life, eternal life? And how do you acquire a relationship with God? Well, I mean, we have this pattern. If anything is emphasized across scripture, it would be faith. You believe in God. Why would that be the condition? And that's a really strong pattern as you go across scripture. Just let's look at some passages that do this. For instance, we have here 2 Timothy 2 or 2 Thessalonians 2:13 that you from the beginning you trusted through salvation, through sanctification of the spirit, belief of the truth. God desires all men to be saved to come to the knowledge of the truth. Or 1 Timothy 2:7, I'm a preacher and an apostle, I teach of the Gentiles in faith and truth is this word. Or Hebrews 10, 22, draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Okay. I mean, so the pattern is strong. I could look at many others that are more familiar passages, the fact that salvation comes only through faith. See, but why would salvation be by faith? And I think that linkage is exactly what we've been looking at this entire time. It's the recognition that our problem and what we need fixed about us in salvation is not just a status in the abstract, that God now would write our name in the Lamb's book of life, and then, okay, now he'll let us into heaven. That actually what we're talking about in salvation is a complete transformation of our entire selves so that we would be made right and made whole. And how would that come about? Well, let's start with this. You're going to need to know the truth the real truth, not the erroneous thinking, the broken thinking, yes, the false theology that you lived under before you placed your faith in Christ. Faith in Christ is because you need to have your thinking fixed. Salvation extending from your understanding the truth and becoming part of your entire life. That extends further in sanctification. All of this under the doctrine of salvation, how does God make us right again? He does it through the truth. And so I get passages like John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Ephesians 6, 14, how do we do spiritual battle? One of the ways is that we have our loins girt about with truth. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out or we do not act out the truth. I rejoice greatly that I found my children walking in truth. True salvation true sanctification, true being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ would mean that you have rejected error. The false doctrine has been put away. 
And now God is making you new within. He's transforming you. The doctrine of the church, we could do the same kind of pattern here. And what I'm going to highlight here is that under the doctrine of the church, you have also these ideas of the truth being restored, coming to a true understanding, a right understanding of the truth. But now, now it's the group of people or all of God's people coming together around that truth and all of them recognizing what is true obediently so that our hearts are transformed and together as a group, we worship and glorify God in this way. Passages that talk about then the church's responsibility towards truth. First of all, 1 Timothy 3.15, so that you will know how you ought to be sa- behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The truth is core and central to our faithfulness and our health as the body of God's people. Or 2 Timothy 4, 1, I charge you before God. What are you doing in the church? What is the ministry of the church? Well, preach the word. Preach the word faithfully with all long suffering and doctrine. I mean, this is going to be truth laden in order for your heart and lives to be transformed, because the time will come when they will not endure healthy doctrine. They'll heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears, teachers and people who will turn away from the truth and will be turned to fables. What you discover is one of the marks of the actual church versus the false church, the church that offers error. The mark of this, among many other things, is to say, well, the true church gives truth, not error. When you hear within the true church, the truth proclaimed, it is truth according to God's word. How will the church grow? How will the church flourish? Well, Ephesians 4.15, it will happen when we speak the truth in love so that we grow up into Christ in all things. Or Ephesians 4.25, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. I want my fellow members, uh, the members of the church, my church mates, I want them to grow. I want them to flourish in the truth. How do I do that? Go speak the truth. Proclaim the truth faithfully, because that's what will transform human hearts and bring them to life. The last doctrine to consider is the doctrine of eschatology, or the doctrine of the end. And on our way there, I would like to just, let's get our, our, the big picture again. We've gone through each one of the doctrines. We're doing this in respect to error or false teaching. Well, let's see how these pieces relate. We've talked about the doctrine of God. God is the source of truth. The doctrine of revelation, that God's truth is clear. He he is not miscommunicating. And the doctrine of sin and humanity. The problem is not that God's word fails, but the problem is that sin corrupts our thinking. We are not good judges of the truth. And so we need God's word to correct our thinking. But we continued from there. And what we discovered as we continued onward was the doctrine of angels, that this error, theological error, distortion is not just a human thing, but that Satan himself misleads people and confuses their thinking. The doctrine of salvation through faith in the truth, God restores us to wholeness in the truth. The doctrine of the church, God's true people understand, proclaim, and obey the truth. Finally, though, let's recognize the doctrine of the end. And what I'm going to argue here as we discuss this doctrine is to say that it's not just during the present that we see truth contested or that we see theological error set before us, but actually this story of truth versus error, of theological distortion at the hands of Satan, that story continues all the way to the end. So uh, recognizing some passages that show us this. Revelation records Satan's ongoing deception until the very end of time. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, the great dragon Satan who deceives the whole world will be condemned. Revelation 13, 14, Satan will deceive them that dwell on the earth. That there will be until the end all of this sorcery and confusion of the nations being deceived. That Revelation 19.20, the beast and the false prophet will deceive them as they receive the mark of the beast. Revelation 23, Satan will be cut, will be cast into the bottomless pit, that he would deceive the nations no more. Give him a chance to come out for just a short reprieve at the end of the millennium. And 20 verse 8, he will go out to deceive the nations again. The devil, eventually, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. It's a really helpful foundation for thinking about 
the doctrine uh, or the, the theology of false doctrine. It's a helpful foundation to recognize that this is not just a now problem, but actually this kind of pattern, distorting and confusing, misleading ideas from the hand of Satan, this pattern will continue all the way to the end of time. And it'll be climactically fulfilled. Satan will even increase his activity at the end of all things. That takes me then to recognize that there is hope. Because if the story starts out with Adam and Eve dwelling with God and falling into sin by Satan's deception and all of the corruptions and the distortions and all of the misleading that comes in the subsequent centuries, all of the struggle against the truth and false doctrine, all the way to the end until Satan continues to deceive them all. Is there any hope? Or is that just the way it is people will always be confused about doctrine? As a matter of fact, there is hope. W wouldn't it be great if we could have a teacher a theological teacher that knew how to explain things so well that they made perfect sense. I mean, he could explain it with perfect clarity. Wouldn't it be great if he never got it wrong? Wouldn't it be great if we had a perfect teacher who always expressed truth, never confused, never making mistakes? And wouldn't it be great if this teacher was not just really smart or knew about a lot of things? but that if he, if he was actually omniscient and he knew everything, any chance of ever having a teacher like that? Well, I'm certainly not it. But Isaiah talks about a teacher like that. It shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. All nations will flow to it. Every human on, on planet earth will come and, and study in this classroom. Many people will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This is a messianic passage. This is the Messiah. Let us go there. And what will he do? He will teach us of his ways. Out of Zion will go forth the law. The word of the Lord will go from Jerusalem. He will teach and he will clarify all of the confusion and the distortion of the ages. In fact, the result of this then is that when he judges among the nations, when he rebukes many people, that would be a rebuke to say rebuking their sin, but yes, even rebuking their bad thinking. The result of this is peace that will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. There will be war no longer. I mean, one of the results of Jesus, the Messiah, the great and perfect righteous eternal teacher is that theological error will be set aside. And with it also the chaos and the horror of sin that has plagued humanity across the ages. And I even get this when I go to the end of Revelation and I extend out this, this end of the story. Revelation 25, 1 verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I'll ma I make all these things new. He said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. These sayings, again, at the beginning of 22 verse 6, are faithful and true. God has sent his angel, his messenger, to show unto his servants the things which shortly must take place. I mean, all the way at the end of the story, part of the issue and part of the hope is just this memory. Don't wonder and don't question. God says, I'm speaking to you truth. And you can know that the doctrine I'm setting before you is absolutely faithful and true. All of these doctrines then, and the progress of these doctrines as we work across the story of systematic theology, give us hope that the doctrine of God and the confidence that God is truth leads to our confidence that his words are also truth. When he speaks, you can be confident in what he has spoken. And though there is error and confusion, that problem is not with God, it's the problem with us. It's our corruption, our confusion. And yet he has acted to set things right through the doctrine of salvation. Excuse me, the doctrine of angels. We're recognizing Satan as the source of some of that corruption. But the doctrine of salvation, God restores us to wholeness in the truth. As God's people, we come together and fellowship in the truth, the doctrine of the church. And finally, it will climax in the end when God victoriously sets aside every lie. He brings us eternal truth in his presence. The last major concept, though, that I would like to continue with is I want us to understand 
truth or theological error and to recognize that all, not all errors are exactly the same. So what I mean by this is that we sometimes have kind of a, just a simple category. It's either true or it's false. Right. And that's it. Right. Okay. Here's the truth. Here's true doctrine. Here's error. And I'm done. So if someone disagrees with this or that belief of mine, we look at it and call the person a heretic and, and run them off. And now that's a false church or something like that. I, I'd like to highlight for us that actually truth and error exists along a spectrum. Or let's just recognize that there are different degrees of errors. Not every theological mistake is the same as every other mistake. Not every theological error is exactly a heresy. So let me explain what I mean by that. I'll give that to you in terms of a diagram. And what I'm using here is just that, a kind of a spectrum. If I'm looking across that dimension, those dimensions or a spread of ideas, I'm moving from the left side of the screen, which I'll call more serious errors. On that extreme, the more serious things, and on this extreme, things that are not as serious, okay? And let's see some examples of what I mean by that. Over on the very far side, when I say false religion, we're actually talking about something that is just so broken and so off that it's an entire system in opposition to God. Heresy is something that would actually deny someone salvation. If you believe this, you're not going to be with God in eternity. Doctrinal errors are the recognition. There can be mistakes, but a believer still could make those mistakes. I'll talk about irrelevant questions or distractions. And finally, just simple differences between believers. The recognition that there could be some things that two people believe, but it's not quite at the level of a heresy or an entirely false religion. So uh, let's understand these further and just talk about each one in turn. Starting with the first, I wanna talk about false religion. And we can recognize that the category here is, uh, it's more broad than some of the others, but it's more specific to say, there are specific definitions. We're actually talking about an entire system in opposition to the truth about God. In fact, the definition that I'm using here works exactly like this. It's more than a teaching. It's an entire system. And generally, I would say a false religion refuses to even claim to be faithful biblical Christianity. It's maybe even a direct competitor for biblical Christianity. We're talking about people that would look at Christianity and say, oh, this is a, a confusion and a distortion. You need to leave that and come over here. We're the ones that actually have the truth. Specific examples of that, Islam, Buddhism, you could think of many others, groups that are actually offering themselves as alternatives to Christianity. We have the truth, not Christianity. Specific passages I'll look at with you in just a moment, and these passages describe this within scripture itself. And finally, the pattern I'm going to use with each of these is that there's a response that one ought to have. And the response or the right response to false religion is evangelism. But let's take a look at the passages that describe false religion. I think this will give us a good framework even for thinking about what we're dealing with. The first I'd like to look at you, look at with you is in 1 Kings. And this is the passage where Jeroboam is calling people to go up and have an alternative place of worship. So Jeroboam's reasoning works like this. If this people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, they'll probably turn against me. They'll kill me. They might go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they might follow him instead of me. So being a clever king, a wicked, sinfully clever king, the king took, took counsel. He made two calves of gold. Where did he get that idea? Well, certainly Israel has the history of worshiping the golden calf. And he said to them, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. I mean, that's entirely too inconvenient, too much distance to cover. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That sounds exactly like what Aaron had told the people during the golden calf incident. Here is your God who's led you out and delivered you. But notice now he's reduced God to a golden calf. And it's even striking that there are two. Why would he have two 
I mean, Israel is always, here all Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. So why have two gods? Well, it's more convenient, isn't here, isn't it? He set the one in Bethel. He put the other in Dan. I mean, it's really convenient because you're closer there. You can go there. You're closer there. You can go there. And you realize this is a doctrinal error. It's a false theology. It's a false religion. It's a competing religion literally competing instead of going south to jerusalem that's too far just stay up here it's a lot closer it's a lot more convenient it's right here it's our own system it's competing a competing religion to faithful and biblical worship and that's a false system or a, an alternative religion because it turns people away from the truth then he goes further it's not just setting up these idols but he made it so that there's a house of high places. There's priests out of the people. He ordained a feast, and these are alternative feasts. It's like the feast in Jerusalem, but he comes up with his own. And he sacrifices unto the calves that he made, and he placed in Bethel a priest of the high places that he made. He offered on the altar which he had made in Bethel uh, a sacrifice according to his own heart. He ordained a feast for the children of Israel, the altar burned incense. I mean, there's a lot of similarity here to faithful worship of Yahweh. But it's different enough that it's actually an entirely different religion. You might listen to some of this and say, yeah, but I mean, isn't it just kind of like, it's it's kind of like, faithful, obedient religion, according to God's word, just a little difference, different location. Right. False religions often will mix the genuine truth with just enough error that it takes you off into a different direction. Here's another example. First Kings 18. Elijah came unto the people. And what he's asking here is how long will you halt? The word here is not halt as in stop. It's limp. How will you, how long will you limp back and forth between two opinions? I mean, you can't believe you can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and Baal. That's the argument. If the Lord be God, follow him. If it, the Lord is Baal, follow him. But you can't keep on running back and forth between the two. Well, what, uh, what Elijah is, is highlighting for them, these are two entirely separate religions. Baal worship is a competing false religion. You're going to have to turn to God if you want to find true life. And finally, Revelation 2 gives us a, another parallel kind of concept. There is there in your city, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, and there is an alternative kind of religion, people that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus says, I hate. So false religion then, as an alternative way of thinking about the truth, and a competing framework to say, all right, turn away from Christianity, another system, an entire complete system is the way that you're going to find faithful understanding of the truth. That, of course, is different from the next category. In the next category, I termed heresy. Comment first about heresy before I continue on. Too often, I hear the word heresy used and it's so general, it's kind of expressed something like, well, someone disagreed with me, and so I'll call them a heretic. I would like to encourage you to be a whole lot more careful in your use of the word heresy. Don't throw words around. Be faithful or be clear with the words that you choose. And the way I'm going to define heresy, I think this is a, 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 this is a, a good and, and biblically faithful understanding of the word. If you truly believe this teaching, you can't be a true Christian. So we're not just talking about somebody has a different view of the timing of the rapture, but we're actually talking about something that would come down to, it would endanger your salvation. It would endanger your soul. If you believe this, your soul is in serious trouble. And examples of this heresy, examples would be things like Arianism. Arianism is the teaching that Jesus Christ is not quite fully God. He's kind of God-like or God-ish, but not quite fully God in every sense that God is God. Well, that's a damning error. To believe that Jesus Christ is only partially or somewhat God then endangers your soul because salvation, as we understand it biblically, is impossible. True salvation requires that you actually believe in the full deity of Jesus Christ, because then his sacrifice is sufficient for our transformation. And we can talk about passages also that give us this idea. So 
Acts 20, Romans, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and Jude, many different passages that do this. Now, I, I'd like to highlight then that actually this is one of the big categories across scripture. You know, false religion is there as well. But this is a constant across the New Testament. And let's look at some of the passages that talk this way. For instance, Acts 20, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I, I wouldn't call this a false religion. They're coming within the church and they're trying to draw people away to a, a perversion. It maybe is not quite a full system yet, an entirely complete, complete system that draws them. The distinction I made a second ago, it's when people call it Christianity, but it's not quite actually Christianity. Romans 16, I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you've learned, avoid them. The word here, when we're talking about divisions and offenses, the, the word here is directly tied in with heresy. These are people who serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. By good works and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, the reason that I think this passage is really helpful for this definition, why would why would Paul have to clarify that they are not actually serving Christ? Because they claim to be serving Christ. So here's a part of that critical distinction. Uh, of course, you could consider the doctrines of other religions to also be heretical. But to be more clear about it, a, a heretical teaching would be something that claims to be Christian. Or it offers itself as Christian, but it's not. It's counterfeit. And it's counterfeit to such a degree that, yes, we would say it's not actually Christian. A person who believes this is an unbeliever. 1 Corinthians 5 or 15, if Christ is preached from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Paul's argument is that denying the resurrection of the dead is actually a lethal mistake. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ is not raised. If Christ is not raised, our preaching is vain or empty. Your faith is also vain. We are found false witnesses of God because we did testify that God raised Christ. And so if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. The argument would be to say things like our faith is vain. If you deny the resurrection, you're actually denying salvation. If you deny the resurrection, then your eternity is at stake. It's that serious of a mistake to make. 2 Corinthians 11.3 describes people like this, false apostles, deceitful workers. And I think this is a really helpful description of heresy as counterfeit, counterfeit doctrine, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. They offer themselves as faithful authorities on what Jesus Christ taught. They're counterfeit. And they're counterfeit because if you believe their teaching, you actually aren't a follower of Christ at all. Similarly, Galatians 1 gives us that same concept. People think they're following the gospel. It's not actually a gospel at all. Paul says, I'm afraid for you that you have so quickly turned after the doctrine about Christ. You've turned onto another gospel. It's not another gospel. These are people that are perverting the gospel of Christ. It, it, it's claims to be the gospel. It's a fake one. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be a curse. This is not the gospel. If I preach any other quote unquote gospel, let that person be accursed. And the argument then is really strong. Heresy properly defined is a person who claims or the teaching that claims to be Christian when actually it isn't. How do I respond then to heresy or how should I regard it? What should I do? Well, summarizing the discussion we've had so far, we recognize what this means. If you actually believed it, you would not be a true Christian. Examples of it, denying the deity of Christ. Antinomianism is denying that our actions actually have to follow the truth of the scripture. So a person who says, I'm forgiven, God's grace is sufficient. I don't need to worry about sin. It's okay. I'll do it and nothing will happen. I'll be on my way to heaven regardless. So how do we respond to those kinds of things? Well, it's serious, right? Because we're talking about issues that would lead to someone's eternal damnation. 
And so Jude 3 and 20 to 23, give us some really helpful advice for how we can respond. We clarify, we rebuke, and we oppose. I'll return to this passage in just a little bit, but I think part of the, the help of this passage is that it's showing us there are different responses as we deal with different issues. In this case, dealing with heresy, here's what we would find. That when we deal with this distortion, we must earnestly contend for the faith. It's not just an issue of my view versus yours. This is an actual contending for Christianity. We pray in the Holy Ghost and we seek to contend. We work hard in our own faith, seeking to save others with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So our response to heresy is exactly that. We clarify, we rebuke, we oppose. Heresy is not just a difference of opinions, but it's actually a question of life and death. That takes me to the third category we're using here. The third category, doctrinal errors. And what I'm talking about here now are differences of understanding. They can be important differences. The teaching is clearly incorrect. I mean, it's an actual issue. I can show you in scripture. No, look right here. I can demonstrate it clearly using scripture. It's not just my view, but it's a clear teaching of scripture. And yet, this is important. In the case of a doctrinal error, there is no reason that this person cannot still be a faithful Christian brother. So I, I, I'm looking at the person and I, they're wrong. I mean, their idea on this point, they are incorrect. And yet, I never deny that they are actually a Christian. It would be different for someone to deny the deity of Christ. At that point, I look at that person and I say, I don't think I'm going to see you in heaven if this is truly what you believe. But in this case, no, this is someone who still believes the truth. They're just wrong. Examples of that, tongue speaking. I'm talking about miraculous tongues or people who claim to have the gift of tongues from Pentecost. People who practice ongoing miraculous gifts. I have the gift of healing. I can heal you of your sicknesses. Or people that hold that the Old Testament dietary laws are authoritative for today. Well, I, these issues matter. I mean, this is not just a, well, your view, my view. I can demonstrate pretty clearly from scripture that you should not hold to those views. And yet, I would not say about any of these views that if a person speaks in tongues, they're going to hell or a person who practices the miraculous gifts, or unless a person's trusting it in, in it for their salvation, that would be different. But if a person just believes that we shouldn't eat pork today, I would say they're wrong. I have some biblical reasons that I can demonstrate that they're wrong. That's not just my view. I can show them from scripture. No, that's not true. And yet I have no reason to say that a person like that is facing eternal hellfire. Passages that talk about that or that give us a backing for some of these ideas. Well, let's take a look at those passages and passages that recognize differences or errors like this are real. And yet not necessarily does it mean that the person is an unbeliever or that they cannot truly be saved. An example, Acts 15 is an instance when the apostles are dealing with a pretty difficult issue. The discussion is happening here. They're struggling through these questions. The multitude came together. They gave audience to Barnabas and Saul, and they're declaring to them what God has done. The issue is a pretty difficult one. The question of how, whether Gentiles would be able to be part of the church, should they abstain from the pollution of idols or fornication or things strangled or things with blood? Okay, it's a pretty difficult issue. And there are apparently people within the group that think that a faithful believer should continue to follow the Old Testament Jewish expectations about food and sacrifices and so forth. Well, there's a discussion within the assembly of people, and it doesn't sound exactly like everybody agrees. There are people who actually think it's necessary for someone to follow those Old Testament laws if they're going to be a true believer. That's an issue. I mean, that's, a, that's an actual legitimate problem. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that this is an issue that leads to someone's eternal damnation. Galatians 2 is another example like this. When Peter comes to meet with certain people, Jews and Gentiles, Peter makes a mistake, and it's a serious one. 
Jesus, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. After they came, he withdrew. He separated himself because he was afraid of those who were in the circumcision, the Jewish party. Other Jews also likewise. Barnabas also was carried away. I mean, this is a real mistake. Paul says, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the tr truth, I said to Peter, what are you doing? If you're a Jew living after the manner of Gentiles, why are you compelling the Gentiles to live like the Jews? I mean, Paul is confronting Peter. And I think that illustrates again my idea. This is a serious issue. Peter made a mistake. Peter was wrong. Peter was wrong. It doesn't mean that Peter was an unbeliever. I wouldn't call Peter a false teacher. I wouldn't say that Peter was teaching a false gospel. I would say that Peter made a very serious mistake. Another example like that, 1 Thessalonians 4, I would not have you be ignorant concerning those who are asleep. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then we believe that also those who are dead in Jesus Christ will come with him. Apparently, people at this time are wondering if possibly those who died early, maybe they don't have an eternal maybe they don't have an eternal relationship with God. How will Jesus bring them into his presence for all eternity? He hasn't come back yet. Well, that was a false teaching. That was a real mistake. They shouldn't think that. That's a bad idea. But I would still stop short of saying then that these people are providing a false gospel or that they are teaching something that's going to damn people eternally to hell. How would you respond to that? Or how do you deal with this issue if you're dealing with real doctrinal errors, but still a fellow believer? Well, final response here is to say you correct, you teach, you beseech, you exhort. I mean, you really work with that person to help them see the truth. I don't yet look at them, cast them out, or um, proclaim that they're a false teacher. Everyone needs to distance themselves and never fellowship with them again. I correct. And yes, I may not be able to have a close relationship with this person because this is a legitimate error. There's a real problem in what they're doing. I correct. I might, in a way, distance myself relationally. I exhort. But I don't regard this person as a false teacher or a heretic just because they disagree with the view that I've been proclaiming. Let's move to the next category. And the next category here are irrelevant questions or distractions. This is one that might not strike you as um, immediately obvious as a doctrinal error, but let me give you a definition and, and then explain further what I mean by that. So part of the concept with this goes, we might get doctrine wrong, not just by teaching wrong ideas, but by not teaching the critical, important, central ideas. Okay, examples of this. If you're looking at a particular instance and the question goes, does this question or this theological discussion make any difference? I mean, does scripture ever even address this issue? And, and this kind of thing comes up a lot with, let's say, things I've seen. What is the proper pronunciation of Yahweh or Jesus? Well, people will say and make a big deal. You have to say Joshua or you have to say Jehovah, or you have to say Yahweh, or you have to say something else. And there's all of this distraction about this question. Guess what? We don't know. We ultimately don't know. And if you want to say Yeshua, fine. I mean, sure. Really, if you want to say Jesus, if you want to say it in a different way, okay, who are we talking about? The person who came to earth 2,000 years ago, took flesh, dwelt among us, died on behalf of our sins, and rose again. And his name was Jesus, Jesus, Yeshua. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Is it really then worth all of the attention and effort to go into what do we think is the print? No. Who is the correct replacement for Judas in Acts 1, Paul or Matthias? So if you remember what happened here, the apostles after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus are saying, well, who will replace Judas? There were 12 of us and now Judas is dead. So they cast lots. They chose Matthias. Matthias became one of their number. Well, some people then have pointed out later on the apostle Paul comes. And so maybe Paul was supposed to be the replacement for Matthias and or the replacement for Judas. Maybe Matthias was a mistake. You shouldn't have ever included him. I don't know. <laughs> There's no way to know. Scripture never talks about this. And because it never talks about this, I'm not sure that I'm supposed to spend so much time talking about it either. There are a lot of passages that go down this track 
and highlight for us certain ideas that are not important. They're just distractions from the truth. And let me show you some of those passages. Let's look at them here. Multiple emphases that say, just make sure you're focused on what actually matters. First Timothy 1.4, don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. All that accomplishes, it just creates more questions. Refuse profane and old wives' fables. Except exercise yourself rather into godliness. Don't be distracted about nothing, doting about questions and strife about words. Keep what is committed to your trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings, opposition of false or pseudo discussion. It's not even a, a worthwhile discussion at all. Second Timothy 2.14, charge them that they not strive about words to no profit. Shun profane and vain babblings, foolish and unlearned questions, avoid. People will turn away their ears from the truth that will be turned unto fables. Don't give heed to Jewish fables, commandments of men that turn away from the truth. Avoid foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. They're unprofitable and vain. And you have that pattern even outside the pastoral epistles. Jesus talks about people who worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You have the Athenians and strangers spending all their time and nothing else but to tell or hear some new thing. You have even an unbeliever saying, if this is just a question about words and names and your law, you deal with that. I don't want any person to beguile you with enticing words, or Peter commends them, you have not followed cunningly devised fables. Excuse me, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Instead, we've proclaimed the truth. The int interesting thing about this category is that if, if you initially think about the concept of irrelevant questions, you might really be tempted to think, you know, it's, this is not like false teaching. It's just a distraction. What I'd like to note about the passages we just looked at is that false teaching is not just or only when we deny the truth, but you can get to the same place. You can end up with a kind of false teaching by just ignoring the truth. In other words, one of the dangers of this category, it, it may not be, you may not have denied the deity of Christ. You may not have denied salvation by faith alone. You may not have denied any of those things. But truthfully, just by spending all your time talking about other things, you effectively denied it. Because you're going to have across the years of your ministry, people who know a whole lot about the pronunciation of Yeshua or Jesus or Jesus, and they don't even know the gospel. So realize that false teaching might happen because you taught something that was erroneous. False teaching might happen just because you never bother teaching the truth. And the passages we just, just studied together would tell us the, the right response to this issue. Ignore, turn away from these kinds of vain babblings, and instead replace them with healthy doctrine. The truth is the doctrine that people most need to hear. It is the medicine of their souls. And if you then replace that with some other alternative, recognize that you have actually distorted the truth, not by teaching a false doctrine per se, but just by not even bothering to get around to the one that people most need to hear. Final category, differences between believers. And what I'm recognizing here is that certain categories are not necessarily even an issue of right teaching or wrong teaching. It's just people having a different understanding of certain ideas. And that would fit here as a definition, the, the reality that there are questions that cannot be clearly and definitely answered from scripture and good beliefs believers can differ. It's not even clear who is correct. On, on certain issues, you may have a different view than I. And as you and I look at it, you know, I I can't really prove to you from scripture whether you're right or I'm wrong. We've come to different conclusions and we accept that. We're comfortable with that. There are differences and that's okay. Examples of that. Will Jesus return at the beginning of the tribulation or in the middle? Now, I believe strongly that Jesus will return at the beginning of the tribulation. I'm recognizing, however, that another believer might have a different view. I, I think I'm right. But, you know, I, I don't know that I can just make this so clear that I could say you're in error. 
I would stop short of that. I mean, I do think my view is right. And the more I study, I'm more convinced by it. But I'll stop short of saying, I know I'm right and he's an error. He is teaching a, a wrong truth, a wrong doctrine. I wouldn't go that far. I'm not that clear. Can a person who is divorced before their salvation later serve as a deacon? Yeah, I have a view on that. I, I would prefer not to follow after that. I, I, I think the the concept in the, in the pastorals to say a person who is a man of one woman, a person, a man of one woman would, would preclude or eliminate a person who is divorced. But I don't know that I can go so far as to be confident on the level of teaching this, I know I'm right, here's the other view and it's wrong. Examples that work like this, Romans 14 is a really interesting discussion where Paul is recognizing real differences between people and that those differences might just stand that way. So Romans 14, one person esteems a day as better, another esteems all days long as all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul is okay with believers having different views on this point, and he's okay with them being fully convinced. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why would you despise your brother? God ultimately is the judge on these kinds of points. Now, be faithful or careful about the language. It's not saying that there's never a time to look across at another person and say, you're in sin. Scripture does it itself. Scripture calls us to point to certain things and identify them as sin. So there is a time to judge. But what we're actually talking about here is a person with a specific issue where I can't so clearly and absolutely demonstrate this is right, this is wrong. And so my conclusion, I'll just accept that I have one view, this person has another view, and that's okay. Therefore, Paul says, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. Rather, decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. And if you work through the passage looking for this word brother, you're going to find this is a major idea throughout the passage. Paul continues to view these individuals as brothers. He's not looking at another person because they have a different view and calling them an unbeliever or rejecting them. It's still a brother. The person has a different view. That's okay. The person is still a a brother, and we respect and appreciate him accordingly. So what would you do, or how do you handle an issue in this category of just differences between believers? Well, you're not refuting or attacking or going against them. You're abiding with patience. You should seek not to create further conflict. You should seek to dwell in peace and love, recognizing that there are differences. I have a different view than him, and that's okay. Accepting that as part of biblical Christianity and faithful Christianity. So to summarize once again, we've seen all of these different categories on a kind of a spectrum. We're recognizing that not every theological issue is the same, but that as we move across the spectrum, there is then, uh, yes, a legitimate progression here. Serious doctrinal errors, well, even false religions. Heresies, we defined as teachings that would actually condemn someone to eternity in hell. Doctrinal errors, now we're talking between actual believers. They're still brothers or they're still believers, but this person's in error. I can look at their teaching and say, that's wrong. That's not biblical. Irrelevant questions or distractions. A person who just is so occupied with things the Bible doesn't talk about, then they never talk about the things the Bible does say. And finally, differences between believers in which we accept that I have a view, another person has a view, and it's okay for us to be different on this point. We agree to disagree, and we learn to dwell with each other in a loving way. Summarizing our lecture or our discussion together then, we have discussed together a theology of false theology. We've discussed together a whole, an entire framework for how to think about different views. And we've acknowledged that these views exist on an entire spectrum, but that ultimately the truth comes from God revealed in his word, distorted by our hearts, corrected through salvation, and defended by the church, people, the people of God together defending the truth until eternity when we sit at the feet of the chief teacher who will always proclaim truth.
And in the process of that, then there are some conclusions we can draw for our own responses, gratefully to turn to the truth and to love it and to obey it. Some applications or some encouragements I would make for our own handling of a theology of false theology. Remember that truth or ideas exist along this entire spectrum. And so, yes, the question of what is true and faithful theology, that might be quite broad in terms of, as we look across, which error or which issue we're talking about. Not every error is a heresy. I don't need to say that just because someone disagrees with me or has a different view that they're a false teacher. Be careful before you call something a heresy. Know that it is actually a heresy. And other issues might be something that we just accept as differences between believers. Okay, these are two different views. That's okay. But I have to recognize then when certain things come, and yes, they are actually damning to people's souls, or they actually are against the clear teaching of scripture, recognize what they are and deal with them accordingly. My response is across this line, depending from false religion, which I oppose, all the way to differences between believers, which I joyfully accept and learn to live in a loving way. I ought to be able to respond differently across the entire spectrum. How will you know? I mean, it sounds really intimidating and difficult. How will I possibly be able to tell the difference between all of these things? How will I possibly be able to identify heresy, doctrinal error, irrelevant questions, or whatever else? How do I distinguish them all from each other? And the key for this will be the answer I give for every aspect of theology. That's a difficult question, right? How do I possibly identify error and distinguish it from heresy and from false religion? Well, how do I answer any questions in theology? Theology itself is carefully answering questions about God and the world using scripture. So in this case, if you're going to be prepared to faithfully deal with error, identify it and correct it. I have no other solution for you other than you'll need to know scripture, lots of scripture, and know it really well, and be prepared to proclaim it clearly and carefully. You're going to have to study your Bible a lot. And after all of that study, God will give you the direction to know and to identify which teachings are clearly false. Final admonition or application for our own understanding. I'd like to remind you that though we talk about error, false religion, doctrinal mistakes, heresy, let's remember that it's not as simple as I am the hero that always knows which truth is faithful and I'll always get the right conclusion. In fact, part of the problem with an idea of someone saying, well, they disagree with me, therefore that's a false teaching, is the assumption that I am the one who knows what's correct. Maybe I'm the one who's mixed up. Maybe the idea I hold to so preciously as an important doctrinal uh, commitment, my stand, maybe my stand is actually the mistake. Maybe he's right and I'm wrong. And I have a reminder for humility, theological humility, and carefulness. Second Peter chapter 3, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for the faithful return or the return of Christ and the victory he will bring. How would you stand so that you don't fall into to false teaching? Well, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. Count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Read his word. Yes, even the difficult things. Difficult matters that are hard to understand, study at all. Why? Because knowing this, you can be carry, careful that you are not carried away with the error of laws, lawless people. You can be careful that you won't lose your own stability. And the only way you can do that is by knowing the truth beforehand. But, but just as importantly, verse 18, by continually growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. What's the ultimate antidote, the safety, the vaccine that would keep you from falling into error? What will protect you from the corruption of wrong ideas, satanic ideas? 
that are so appealing and sound so good and so right? What could possibly keep you safe from all of that? And there is no answer that would give you confidence greater than this. You'll have to continually grow. You'll have to be in the word constantly and never turning away from it, constantly returning by God's grace. It is possible to grow, to flourish, and yes, to stand faithfully against false teaching. A theology of false theology helps guide us in our own uprightness so that you and I would live faithfully and obediently, loving God's word, studying God's word, submitting to God's word until he comes. In that and in that alone, then, we have the confidence to know that we stand faithful and that we will not fall to this false teaching on the standard of God's words and what he has spoken.